Welcome to our last in a series of 10 Wednesday weekly webinars. And my name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'll just give you a real brief introduction, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about Todd Weinman, who is our speaker today. First, we're really happy to see all of you here. We've had really good participation in these webinars, and we hope to continue to do these in the future. So we're always looking for your input on topics that you're interested in. Uh, I think you've all figured out the system. We have you in listening mode. If you can go ahead and type your questions in the chat pod anytime that Todd is talking. But we're going to keep it on the topic of youth gardening today. Because gardening is a huge topic, and we just are going to focus in on youth gardening and some best practices. Uh, we'll have time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. And final plea, uh, please fill out the short survey that will be sent to you at the end of the webinar. That will let us know if you learned something and to also give us some feedback for future webinars. And again, we hope to continue to offer these. This was all part of a Field to Fork grant from the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. And I certainly invite you to check out all of the resources that we have online. And there is a handout about gardening with youth with some specific instructions and you know, recommendations, I should say, about gardening with youth. So with that, I'm going to give you just a quick introduction of Todd. I've known Todd for many years. He is the extension agent in Cass County, and his specialty is horticulture. And the horticulture program in Cass County includes public, providing the public with current research-based information on gardening, lawn care, plants and flowers, trees and shrubs, and many other horticultural topics. And Todd's programs include helping with the Master Gardener program, the Junior Master Gardener program, and also with urban gardening. So thank you, Todd, for being with us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Julie. Um, we'll get started here. Um, one thing that when you work with youth or with kids, um, you want to them to have success. And so, for example, um, you want to have a little fun with them, too. So. What I always try to do, like say someone comes up to me and says, I'm working with 12 second graders. What can I, what can I do to get them engaged to enjoy the product, project and get going? Here's some, some instant real fire winners right here. Um, one thing to remember is you can do seeds, but seeds are small. And so if you do just like little carrot seeds, you'll find that when they start growing in the row that the kid kids we're working on, there'll be 400 carrots coming up in a little 3 by 3 inch area and the rest of the row will be barren. Um, so what I would suggest is successful, fun types of plants to grow. First being potatoes, uh, blue or purple. Um, one thing to remember with blue or purple potatoes, they are blue or purple and they're very fun, they're nice. The problem is, is that they're very aggressive plants. So if you plant one blue or purple potato, it's a good chance that everything within three feet circumference around it will be destroyed because it will just continually grow. And you can use these on a trellis, and that's a nice way to do it, but they will take over an area. Another thing that has done very well with kids is sunflowers. Um, if you want to have a fantastic project with kids, get some giant Russian mammoth sunflowers. I grew these in my backyard one year, and they were 21 feet tall. Um, people would stop on the sidewalk, look at my backyard, and go, what are these people looking at? Oh, the sunflowers, because you could see them. They were just gigantic. Kids love it. What I would suggest is get enough sunflowers to build a square, and you tell the kid, kids or youth, I use it interchangeably, um, we're going to build a fort here, and what we're going to do is we're going to make it, for example, 8 feet by 8 feet, and they have them put the sunflowers and say, the plant that comes from this little seed will be taller than you. They won't believe you. They'll help you plant it. You have a square walled fort with just a square row of sunflowers. You make, a, make basically the walls of the sunflower plants as you plant them, um, and the kids will love it. Tomatoes, a lot of kids would, would rather never eat a tomato, but if you grow or have them grow yellow pear tomatoes or basically any kind of cherry tomato, um, they'll be success. Why do I say yellow pear? Um, I don't really, you know, the flavor to me is kind of bland. However, they do look like a little tiny yellow pear. And 
it'll be a novelty for the kids. They'll love it. They'll actually eat it. Um, it'll go really good. Beans. Um, if you're gonna, you know, you have kids that you have a large seed, you want to plant, have them plant it. Do yellow or purple. They may not have ever seen a yellow or purple bean. Um, it'll be a huge success. They'll eat them. They'll say, "Wow!" And the purple beans will turn green when you cook them. Radish. I would do round or icicle. Radish are nice because they grow so fast. You can have radish within 28 days if all things go well. Um, it, it's fantastic. So I would do round and icicle, and they might not like the flavor, but they sure will like to grow them. And you're wondering, well, where can we possibly get these different types of um, colored vegetables and flowers that are that are regular, not really like on the beaten path? Um, you know, whoever heard of purple carrots or purple lists or what have you? Um, one one place to start looking that, and you want to look up um, the Home Garden Variety Trials by um, Dr. Tom Kelb. He has a number of different types of vegetables that do well here, and he has little variety trials across the state for different people to participate in. Here's um, how you can get started on that. So if you're interested in that, great. The other thing is this catalog, the North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trials, um, is fantastic. It has recommended variety trials. Or excuse me, cultivars for our state that have done well here, and it's um it's a lot of fun. Different types, different colored fruits and vegetables that you ordinarily wouldn't like try, and the kids would would really like it. Sometimes people want to do projects with kids. Um, Tom Kelb, Dean Ockrey, and myself are part of the North Dakota Junior Master Gardener Program. Each year. We get thousands of dollars, um, right around thirty thousand in most years, to distribute across the state. Um, unfortunately, we have well, well, it depends on how you look at it. We are not able to provide money or funding to all the projects that come to us. There are some fantastic projects that we we just didn't have the money for. They were beaten up by projects that were slightly better or had a, a little a different twist on it, and so it's very difficult sometimes to send out. Um, Sorry you did not get this um, funding for this year, but please um, do apply again next year type of thing. Um, we, we do a, a lot of projects with these kids. Thousands of kids are, are benefiting from this across the state of North Dakota. It, it doesn't go into other states. Um, and the projects are for different types of beautifications, growing food for the hungry, um, many of the long-term care facilities, uh, you name it, um, the different youth involved with clubs, uh, 4-H, FFA, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, schools, libraries, churches, it, it just goes on and on. So it's a, it's a great way to um, potentially get some funding and, and start your project that way. Here's a, a little bit more uh, on that. Um, it goes through the different um, why would we want to garden with kids or why do we need to garden with kids. Um, Many of our children actually um, do not get enough vegetables to, to be healthy, and a lot of them don't get enough physical exercise to to be healthy either. Um, by gardening, even if it's a small little one or two row garden that they have going, they're going to grow vegetables, and if they're growing them, they have ownership, and they're more than likely going to eat the vegetables that they grow. And it's some physical activity; and they're outside, and they're and they're learning about how plants grow. It's 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 all win win win. I have um, some different groups that I work with, and I don't have them all on here, but here's just a few highlights. Um, I work with Charism, um, and the, the coordinator or the community outreach coordinator is Andrea, Andrea Jane, and we do a lot of work out there together. Um, I don't know who has more fun, the kids or me, and I'll just go through a few things um, with some of these different projects. Um, sometimes the kids will say, hey, I think this is ready to pick, and I have to kind of, well, no, let's leave it on for another few days or another week or another month, because um, they don't know. They may have never have gardened before, and they just don't know when to actually harvest the vegetables. So it's good to be out there. You don't have to be out there all the time, but it's good to be out there and answer the questions when they have them. You have to start sometime. We, this garden's been planted, and um, we're doing a harvest here where we're going to go through and pick some different things. One, one aspect of when you're working with kids is sometimes they're smarter than you realize. And um, life cycles are really big with kids. That's, the, that's kind of the buzzwords or the words that um, all the schools are using. What is the life cycle of this or that? And so I incorporate that, and I'll talk to the kids about 
photosynthesis, fertilizing, um, weeds, different types of watering mechanisms, um, why plants are growing this, why do they need micronutrients, how much do they need for macronutrients, uh, just a number of different things that they can um, hopefully use when, they, when, they're, when they're in their science classes in school. Some of the, some of the kids I've worked with in, in different um, groups and situations and environments, they might never have um, seen some of the vegetables are growing, you know, or else they've seen them, but they're already processed in a jar and they're pickles. And so um, I remember this one little kid goes, wow, these cuc cucumbers can be pokey. And, and some cucumbers do have these little tiny, oh, pokies, or they're not really a thorn, but they're on there. And it's a fun learning experience, especially if they've never encountered it before and only had the processed food. Sometimes um, you, you need to make a little game out of it. Um, if we're looking for an eggplant that's ready to harvest, uh, who can find the first purple eggplant um, fruit that's ready to harvest? And so we get involved that way. It, it's fun to do it in a fun in a fun way, or I guess that is kind of a strange thing to say, but it's it's more rewarding to make the project fun for the kids. They'll be more involved, a lot more a lot more activity if they like, yeah I found it. And the next time you're out there, it's like no I'm going to find it this time before before my friend does type of thing. So make a little game out of it. It helps with the learning too. Um, this picture was taken after our harvest and you can see we got a number of different things that the kids actually grew and took care of. I didn't notice that one of the kids was giving me the rabbit ears behind the picture. Um, so we have a lot of fun, you know, and, and it's an experience. When you work with kids, you always want to um, try to make it at their level, but you don't want to dumb it down to a point where it just isn't of value to them. I like to keep it at a level where they'll understand, but they'll also learn. And they'll say, well, what does um, photosynthesis mean? And they will go through the cycle uh, with sunlight and water as a waste product and such. And um, I'll ask them questions about it. And so making it fun is, is the way to go with this type of thing whenever you work with kids. The other thing, too, is when you work with kids, um, all my master gardeners that work with kids, I have them run through Child Protective Services. Um, we do it with the 4-H program here. Um, it's just what we do. And if people, if adults aren't willing to do that, they don't get to be involved with it. That's just how it is. Senka, that was um, a completely different environment. The kids are a lot smaller. Um, I got, whenever I do this, if I can get the directors involved, and sometimes you can, um, that's it, there's a lot more ownership with the project and you can really get going on it. Here we're, we, we had some money, we we're building some raised beds. Um, there's two different sites and here's one of the sites. I let them do a lot of the work. I pretend I'm working. I have a shovel there. I just move it from one side of the building to the next. But really, um, we, we all worked together and it was extremely windy that day and we got these little beds made. They had enough funding for that and we put some different soil in there and such. And it was all all win win win. Getting the especially the directors and the people involved with the project involved, you can hardly go wrong. Did some basic types of um, training with them. Um, not every situation that I encounter with that working with these kids is different. And so, if you remember the last um, garden we had a charism, that was in the ground. It wasn't a raised bed. This is a raised bed, and they want to have a barrier, and so you use the newspaper barrier in there and went with that route. We didn't use any type of um, weed killer. The plants will need some fertilizer. We have um, sometimes we have soilless media, and sometimes we don't. Slow release fertilizer is is a win win win. You apply it, you mix it in when you're working in your soil and your peat moss and compost, and sometimes even when you have um, soil or compost and manure. I'll work in the slow release fertilizer, follow the directions, and then you're done for the year. You don't have to worry like. Oh, make sure I better call them and um, next week they need to fertilize the cucumbers. No, you're done. It's in there. It's a product that just releases slowly throughout the year and it's um, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun to do that. There's a number of different soil amendments. The nice thing, you know, in this situation, if we wanted to, we could have basically made three different soil um, soils for our boxes. We didn't, but you could and just compare them and so what I found is that when you start adding different things, after a while you, you find your own basic recipe or mixture for for the boxes and that works well for you and um, you go with that. Now we have a very heavy clay soil here in, in the valley and so I tell people not to add 
any, add any sand or gravel. Um, many times when you add sand or gravel to our environment here, what you now make is an adobe brick. And that's very difficult to work with and hard to fix. Um, so, but if you, if you, you should know your soil and your environment before you start. And if you don't, um, ask people or extension agents or what have you say, hey, what do we have here? And, and they'll know. Here they are completed. If you look, they're, they're almost at the top, but they're about an inch or two below the lip of the, of the um, wood there. The reason is, is that when you water, if you put it right to the top, the seeds and everything goes right over the side and you have to replant. This way the water stays in, so you don't flood the garden so it runs over the sides. And that's um, very important. If you look too, um, you can make these out of a number of different products. Do not use railroad ties or anything treated with um, creosote or arsenic or different types of things. I, I avoid treated wood. Pressure treated wood I use, but it's pressure treated, not chemically treated. And um, here I just have pine that isn't treated. We have the kids paint, paint it white, and then they paint flowers, designs, and hello grandma, and what have you on the sides of these. And they get ownership that way with it also. Um, I use pine. It seems to last about four or five years. Um, then I start over. It's very inexpensive. It's cheap. And if you want, um, if you have more money, you can use brick or block. Um, or if you have um, more money also, you can use cedar. But here we didn't have as much money for that, and um, they're somewhat temporary, so we use pine. As you can see, the wind has um, is still blowing, and it's actually blowing our hair right off our head. Um, but here we are. We have finished the project, and um, the happy little kids can then plant in it. Here is at the other site. Um, the other site was... Oh, still um, preschool kids, just, um, you know, a different location in the town. And we also did a hunger-free garden here, and um, produce was donated, and it, it's all win-win-win. One thing is get kids involved, and we had, you know, for example, the vegetables I talked with, some of those, and then they also wanted to plant different things out here, and that's fine. But when I, remember, whenever you're working with kids, if you're, for example, doing plants, like a tomato plant, and you have room for six, and they're little kids like this, not a bad idea to have 12. Um, the reason is, is that there's a good chance half of them will be destroyed before they even make it into the soil. And so if you have a backup plan like that, it's not a bad idea. Or if um, later in the week um, someone leans on it or falls on the plant and crushes it, you can just take another one and slide it in, and, and it's all good. And also, um, try to get bigger seeds. For example, like beans or peas are nice to grow. Um, if you get into carrots, um, it's, it's basically a nightmare. They'll dump them all in one spot, and now you've got a carrot shrub growing and nothing in the other parts. I talked about the extra plants and seeds. Right before this hap, right before I, um, this picture was taken, the little girl there, really cute. Um, had accidentally ripped the tomato plant in half, and um, we just gave her another one, and she planted it right away. We kind of watched so she would destroy that one, and, and then it's all good. I like to get the media involved whenever I work with kids. Um, here's a project I did out in Castleton with their, with their um, I think it was, it was actually their fourth graders out there, and Basically, I taught them how to do container gardening, and everyone got to take home a, a tomato that was potted up in a container. And if you can get the media involved, that's great. You want to talk to the teachers, though, first and say, hey, I'd like to get the media involved. Can we take pictures of these kids? Can it go in the newspaper? And, and sometimes you can. And sometimes they say, uh, no, these two kids cannot have pictures taken. And then you just don't take pictures of those kids. So they might be sitting farther to the left. Or... Um, what I do is I have the actual instructor take the picture of the kids because they know who they are and it's not a problem. Sometimes people have gone and gotten written permission. Um, certain things are public and this is a public area that we did this in so it was fine. Um, just try to do it the, well, do it the right way. If, you, if a kid can't have a picture of the newspaper or in social media for whatever reason, don't put one in there. Um, also what I like to do is for example, I, that was at Castleton a few years back. Um, I wrote a grant, um, and I got money, and we're going to do not only tomatoes with kids this year, but we're also going to talk about honeybees and apple trees. And what I'm basically saying is this. Um, 
if you work at a place and everything went really good and you want to improve your project, go right ahead. Keep the topic of somewhat of an interest to the kids. If you talked about growing Brussels sprouts, there won't be a kid there interested. Now, tomatoes you can kind of get by with. All kids like bugs or insects, so honeybees are good. And apple trees, um, we're going to get the kids to plant some apple trees. You have to watch so they don't actually cut their feet off or their neighbor's foot with the shovels, but we're going to have them do that. They have some ownership, and it's, um, it's a good deal. This picture doesn't um, really give it justice. It's an older picture I had. Um, I also have uh, McKinley Youth Gardens in North Fargo. And it depends on the year. We've had up to between 60 to 120 different um, youth garden plots up there. They're 20 by 20 plots. And I have adult volunteers that have been child youth um, protected certified. Um, I space them throughout the gardens. And when kids are out there, they can basically have um, any questions are asked to these adults, and, and the kids get to know them, and they know where their garden plots are, so they say, hey, I've got a question. Is this a plant? And they'll say, yeah, you probably shouldn't have pulled out the pepper plant. But, um, you know, so they'll teach them some basic things that they don't know. And and, and it's a lot of fun. And working with kids um, is very rewarding. It can be really mentally draining, but um, the energy they have, it just kind of really brightens your spirit, and it's a lot of fun. One thing with these gardens, too, and everyone has different um, different types of situations, but this is a community garden, and so I have kids garden here. I don't have, um, if somebody says, yeah, I, I would just like to, to have a garden, and they're not one of my adult volunteers, I send them over about a block away to, there's other community gardens about a block away, I send them there. So this is for youth. And the gardens here, we don't allow any type of um, herbicides or pesticides. Everybody has to stay in their own garden. You can look in other people's gardens, but you can't be in other people's gardens. They have to have their parent or guardian with them when they're out there. And, and no animals. You can't bring your dogs and cats to run through the garden. So um, you got to have rules, and you need to follow. I've done some other community gardens, too. This is a youth garden that we started up in Hankinson, um, in the county to the south of us in Richland County. And I was um, talking with Senator Heitkamp one day, and, and she said, hey, Todd, you ever going to do anything in my county? I said, sure. And so um, we did. It, it, this is um, not my project, but I did help with this project. And um, one of Senator Heitkamp's aides is here with me taking a picture. And if you look in the background, um, they've got flowers. There's little weeds. And it's just fantastic. Um, so working with kids and, and getting involvement from others, other entities other than yourself is, is really rewarding. Here's a little um, little follow-up on what I just said, and um, basically she wanted to have a, an event there. And I did a PowerPoint or a, um, impact report, so if you're an age, a newer agent um, in extension and you don't know about PowerPoints, um, you can look at this. I, 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 I'm not PowerPoints, I'm sorry, but um, impact statements. And I, and I basically did an impact statement on this garden and um, turned it in for my reporting, and it was very nice. So when you do a project, Kind of keep in mind, you know, you know, the extension response, the impact you had. You know, here we worked with um, Hankson Community American Legion, um, very well attended um, group. They were very good to work with. They provided all the soil, and it was really good. Then you get some um, all feedback from people, and it's interesting. You know, they'll just start people just start talking to you, and they'll say you know, what they liked and uh, what was a success and, and what they look forward to in the future. Also, whenever you're, you know, in the situation that I'm at, you always want to promote yourself. Um, you might think that others are going to do it, and, and they might, but they might miss something that you think is worthy. Um, so here's um, a couple of different um, art or, um, publications that I've worked on, and they go right hand in hand with this. Guard Delights for All. This is a great one with kids. There's a cute little picture, or a cute picture of a little girl on the front. I think she's missing most of her teeth. Um, it, it's a fantastic publication. It kind of goes through the basics of gardening. The other thing is um, Garden Journal. This is for maybe someone that's a um, little bit more advanced that would like to have a journal of what did they do last year and how they can improve it for the following year. And so um, these um, two you can um, look up and you can and have right at them and use them. So, um, 
working with youth and their requirements. Now, youth or kids are not all the same. It's amazing. You're just looking at completely different um, thought processes or range of um, learning. Uh, for example, I'll go through some of these. Um, sometimes I work with the YMCA, and they'll have kids 5 to 17 years old there, and a 5-year-old learns differently than a 17-year-old, and they have different interests. Um, you can teach them both about ladybugs, but with a 5-year-old, you might have to actually have a little poem or sing, or maybe part of the thing, they can draw a picture of their ladybug that they saw that day. Um, you get into the 17-year-old, you might say, okay, let's throw them on the microscope, and um, I want you to start naming some of the prices, prices, excuse me, some of the um, parts of the insect, and uh, maybe the scientific or genus and species name of them, and you make it a little more worthwhile their time. I worked with kids that have had Asperger's syndrome. Um, I think I learned more from them than they did for me. They have a, a different way of thinking than 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 um, I do, I guess. And uh, it was quite a rewarding experience for me. And I, I always hope that they learned um, something from what I taught them. I know they did, but um, I, I felt that I actually learned more. Um, maybe you work with kids with um, some kind of physical disability. Um, you can work with wheelchair gardens, for example, if you're doing a raised bed like the ones we had earlier. They're too short for a wheelchair. And so what you can do is have the kid out, kids out there and just kind of assess, okay, they're about this tall. Let's make the beds so that they accommodate the wheelchairs. Um, that, that, that's um, all win right there. Um, English is a second language. You might have um, kids from different countries. I know that I worked with some kids in West Fargo that had been refugee camps for six years of their life. Um, and so their um, their gardening skills are, are not what you might expect at, for example, their age. And so you'll have to adapt to that. You might have to um, teach them at a level that's um, maybe um, a little less than what you would expect for a kid that age. It doesn't take long for them to catch up, but you have to start at a level where they can actually do and then catch up. Also, um, there are certain um, different types of religious restrictions sometimes. Uh, you know, there, there's just so many different types of things you can work with. You just have to kind of know the audience you're with and remember that they're kids. And so they're going to want to have fun. They're going to want to learn. But you also have to be the adult and you have to be in charge. And you have to be the one that says, okay, we're doing this. And so um, it's very rewarding. Um, whenever I do a talk, I always leave time for questions. But my, my big disclaimer is questions about this talk only. I really don't want to hear... Um, questions about celebrities, um, what I did when I was a kid, I just won't answer. So if you have questions, fire away. If anyone's still there. I think Julie said um, to, to type them in the chat room. But if you don't have questions, that's fine too. I'll give it a little bit here. So Todd, I have a question for you. What are the relative merits of using square foot gardening with youth versus random gardening that I've seen? <laughs> okay. Um, the square foot gardening is a really nice method. Um, for example, let's say you have a regular garden in the ground, but small. Let's say it's four feet by four feet. And you can get maybe two or three rows in there, and that's it. With a square foot garden, you actually don't have any walkways. And so instead of a walk path, you put another row of vegetables. Um, and so instead of three rows, now you've got seven. And it, it, the square foot gardening type of a method, you can make it into one foot by one foot zones. Um, you can make them one and a half by one and a half foot zones. You can make little zones out of that. So if it's four by four feet, you now have 16 zones where in theory you could grow 16 completely different kinds of plants that um, if they fit in that zone, and you can tell, like, well, how do you know if they fit? Well, you look at the, the package where you buy your seeds, and it'll say, okay, for example, um, in the row, keep plants nine inches apart. So you could easily have in a, a square foot um, maybe two plants in there without a problem, nine inches apart. Or if it says um, keep plants one and a half feet apart, well, you might have to deviate and make your, instead of um, one foot by one foot, now it's one and a half feet by one and a half feet, drop your tomato plant in there and away you go. 
Um, the, the advantages of square foot gardening is you save space, water, fertilizer, sunlight, and and, and there's less weeding. Um, you don't have to have a walk path. You don't push the soil down, so the soil has more tilt. It's more friable. Um, with these types of gardens, the next year, all you do is add some more soil or just work it up and add some more slow-release fertilizer. You can tell by what you need, and you probably need to add slow-release fertilizer each year. Um, but then you just work it up by hand a little bit, or don't work it up. If it's nice and friable, you don't need to. Um, with a garden that's in the ground, many times you have to rototill it, and you walk in the paths, you make them really nice and hard. Um, so it's, it's actually better for the soil. And also, there's um, better drainage, and there is uh, a factor of it, it's warmer. And so if everyone, well, we can't really start you know, gardening until about a week when the soil gets up to 50 degrees, your soil, your raised bed garden might be ready a week ahead. And in the fall when it gets cold, um, you have good drainage, you get a lot of rain, for example, not a problem, it drains right out. You don't have standing water in there. So I would say that's the advantage. And then also when you get to be older like me, um, you don't like to always bend over and grab and pull weeds out. Back gets kind of sore. You can just walk out there, pull the weed, throw it on the lawn, and continue on. And if it rains, you don't have to worry about walking in the mud. You just reach out and grab a tomato. You're standing on your lawn, or if you have brick underneath there, or what have you. Um, it's not a problem harvesting. Okay, Todd, I have a follow-up so. question. I have a follow-up question. Do you yeah. have suggestions for um, planting? miniature gardens in pots for kids. Yeah, if you want to do, for example, like a container garden, um, one thing is that the container or the pots will have to have good drainage. The reason is that our water, for example, here has a little bit of salt in there, and if you don't ever let that water run through the bottom, what happens is you build a salt layer up, and then one water does hit that, you now have salt water that your plant is trying to to use and that's very hard on it. The other thing is um, you can put the soil you want in there. A lot of times it's like, well, I really don't know what to do. Go to your nursery and say, hey, what do you use for your potted tomatoes? They look fantastic. They'll say, well, we use this and that's what I buy. I, I just, that, and I've always had success um, when I've done it that way. And you can, um, for example, you don't have to grow all the food you eat, but maybe you want to just grow some herbs. Maybe you want to grow chocolate mint. Maybe like to, um, which is a fantastic herb, by the way. I um, I grow it and I take it and I crush it up, add a cup of sugar to it in a in a pitcher, and it tastes like drinking gum. If you like to, the flavor of gum and you'd like to drink it, that's what I would recommend doing. Um, so you can grow some herbs or a little cherry tomato. One plant that does very well in a container garden, and it's not really utilized all that much, is eggplant. Eggplant loves container gardens. Um, biggest thing is make sure it's big enough. You know, you might have a um, 5-gallon or 10-gallon pail. Yeah, you can grow a tomato in there. You have an ice cream pail? No, not so much. It, 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 the roots will get so tight in there it won't be able to do well. I saw somebody had a question, but I think I missed it. I don't know who it was. If, um, you have a question, if you want to type it in the chat, unless I answered it, um, obviously then you don't have to. But um, I just saw a little red flash and then it disappeared, but I didn't get the name, so I don't know who had a question for me. Any other questions for Todd? If there are further questions, I just want to thank you again for attending our webinar today. Please explore the resources. We have a lot of ag mags. We have, you know, various how to grow and how to use different different plants. So please check out our resources online. Todd has a bunch of YouTube videos on the CAS Extension website. So check those out. And it looks like <laughs> and I wasn't kidding about the pie thing either. So if you just remind Julie who you were, and um, I'm sure she will follow up on that and deliver a homemade <laughs> apple or blueberry pie to your home. Well, thank you again, everybody. I can't promise a pie, but Todd will probably make you something. It probably won't be very tasty. Thank tasteful. you very much. We'll close today's webinar. Thank you, Todd. <laughs>